at Red Hat, um, mostly kernel um, and a lot of eBPF work recently. Um, I have a few notes up front. Um, I'm super happy to answer questions, um, but please keep them until the end and we can have also lively discussion about that. Um, one thing, like the second thing, I designed a talk for an audience that is kind of knowledgeable in eBPF already, so it helps if you've already written eBPF, but hopefully you can follow along if you didn't so far. Um, the reason for that is that my goal of the talk is to show you new ways how you can improve EB your eBPF programs, so you can, yeah, switch from writing small toy programs to like writing normal eBPF applications, like bigger ones where you can do more complex stuff. Um, like I said, I'm working on networking mostly, so um, I'm s my examples might be slightly screwed towards networking, but that doesn't mean that they don't apply to, um, to tracing use cases, it's just my examples usually come from networking. All right, so let's get started. I want to cover basically four topics today. Um, the first thing is modern eBPF. What do I mean when I talk about modern eBPF? Uh, the second thing is, I want to show you how you can compose your eBPF programs, like the small programs you have, into bigger applications. Like there are different use uh, ways to do that, and I want to show you like three of them basically. Um, the third use uh, the third thing I want to show is testing. So with growing complexity in the applications, how do we test them? How do we like go ahead and make sure they do what we they are supposed to do? And the last one is I want to cover eBPF helpers and kernel functions. So those are basically the APIs that you can use from your program. And I want to show you how you can navigate that space and more easily so you know what functions, what APIs are there and which ones you can use. So let's talk about modern eBPF. What do I mean with that? What do I talk about when I talk about modern eBPF? I want to illustrate that with a few examples. Um, I have brought some code snippets here. So all of these code snippets are from the samples in the Linux kernel tree. Um, it's not important what they do right now, but I want to illustrate a, f a few things with them. Um, the first thing I want to illustrate is eBPF a while ago didn't have any loops. Like you could not write loops that you are used to in any normal programming language was not possible in eBPF. The only exception to that was you can ask your compiler to unroll the loop. So basically copy the contents like the body of your um, loop one after another and run that instead. That of course like increases the size of your code and it's not applicable to each and every uh, loop. It has to have an like, upper bound that you know at compile time already. Next thing that was not really possible was calling functions. So you could not just call the function like you would in any other language. It was just not there. Um, the only thing you could do is, again, inline all the functions. So basically copy the contents of the function into your main program. So you have like a constant flow of execution. Or you could use so-called tail calls which basically means at the end of your um, eBPF program, you jump to another eBPF program and execute that instead. But you will never get back to your old or previous function. So it's not really a function call. It's a way to combine programs, but not really a way to call functions. So let's see what improved in terms of loops. eBPF nowadays can have loops. Like you can write loops in your eBPF program. Um, the first edition that we had there were um, bounded loops. So basically, loops that have a fixed upper bound as well. Um, so the verifier can really check, does this loop con like end at some point of time? So you can be sure that it doesn't uh, prevent the kernel from continuing. Um, with that, it was not necessary anymore to unroll the loop. Your compiler might still do it, but it's not necessary anymore. Um, and it covered some use cases, but not all of them. So we later on had uh, further additions to the eBPF or the BPF uh, program environment that were the loop functions, how I call them. So basically the first one that I want to introduce is BPF loop. That's a helper function that you can use in your programs and what it does, it, it takes basically a number of iterations and it runs your, like another function, like a callback function, that number of times. And the number doesn't need to be fixed or constant or anything like that. It's check dynamically at runtime. So at runtime, you can pass it a number that you got, I don't know, from a network packet, for example, and run the loop this and that many times. That's like, with that you can probably support all the use cases you have for loops, right? You can do everything you want with. And then there are other functions that might simplify your life if you're 
want to change uh, if you want to do something different. So there is PPF for each map element, and like the name already implies, what it does is it gives you a way to iterate over the contents of maps with keys and values. So, so all the BPF maps you can iterate over the contents basically. It's also something that was not really doable before, and at least not easily. And now you have like a very useful helper function to to do that, and like a more convenient way for that. Um, let's talk about function calls as well. So eBPF now as well supports function calls, something that was not possible before. And if you now want to write eBPF functions, you write just a normal function like you would in normal C code, and the compiler translates it to real function calls, no inlining anymore, no nothing. Your compiler as well can still inline it, but it doesn't have to, and you can really have function calls. And with that, you get all the benefits of calling functions. You have better modularity, you have like your code size goes down if you're calling, like if you beforehand had an inline function that you would call from many other places, your code grows in size. Now, if you have real function calls, like it's reduced in size again. Um, and one nice thing about it is that every function is treated by the verifier as its own program. So the verifier is that thing in the kernel that basically checks your programs if they are safe to run in the kernel. And it checks each function as its own program. That means that all the limits that the verifier has apply to one program or to one function at a time. So for example, the complexity limit, it applies to your main program first, and then it applies to the function you call second. So it's, you can write more complex applications because you don't run into the limit of the verifier that easily anymore if you break down your application into smaller functions. So those things that I just said, like the function call and the loop, that's just a few examples for what improved in the eBPF territory, so things that you can start using today. Um, now that we can split up our execution into like different functions, let's talk about how we can compose all these functions back together into like a big application or larger application. Um, I want to introduce three different or like maybe two and a half different ideas for how you can do that. And the first thing I want to talk about is how can I do, like how can I compose programs together? Like I, how can I combine them at build time? And it's right now we have a super simple linker in BPF tool. So that's something that was added some point of like a while ago. You can now call BPF tool and link together uh, BPF object files like you would have done with your normal C object files in the past. It really doesn't like, the linker is not that complex like it is for, like a normal linker for, for C user space programs, but you can really do the same basic thing with it. You can have your code in one file, you can declare your function, like functions that you want to call in a header file, you can write the code for that in a different file, compile these things separately, and later on link them together to ship one big binary. But you have your code split over different files so you can organize it nicely and so on. Um, that makes it, like I said, easier to structure your code into something that you can maintain more easily, something that is very important if your application grows in size. Um, and of course, with that, you can build stuff like static libraries, for example. So you can, for example, have a team that maintains all the parsing functions for your network packets. Like I said, I'm mostly networking focused, so networking, parsing network packets is something that we do a lot and you need to do often and you basically the code is the same all the time because the network packets look the same all the time. And you can go somewhere and build, like you can build your library, build your parsing functions into that, and then reuse them where needed. Like basically make an object file of that and link that into your application. So that's a use case for, for like these linkers. Another thing is, imagine you don't have all the object files available at build time. Imagine you want to link stuff at load time or combine programs at load time. Um, the BPF tool functionality I just described is based on libbpf. Um, libbpf is that user space library that's there for basically all your BPF related wishes. And it also exposes the linker functionality I just described to you as a program. So you can programmatically link BPF objects at load time or just before you load the program into the kernel, you can just link it together and then load the result into the kernel. Um, one thing that I could imagine you could build with it is you could, for example, have your application built already 
and allow users to provide you with like their code. Imagine you have like a big networking application and you have one place where you could offer the user or the users of your program to collect statistics, for example. And they can provide you with an BPF object containing the program to generate the statistics and that they, they can extract from your program. And you can link that object into your application at load time so the user can really make use of the eBPF functionality still after you have attached your uh, application. Um, so imagine something like a plugin system in easy terms, right? Um, the next thing I want to talk about is a bit more <laughs> brittle, to be honest. It's called F Replace. So imagine you have a program that you have already attached, that you've already loaded into the kernel, and you want to change parts of that program. So there's a functionality called F Replace. It's available by a syscall, it's available from uh, libppf as well. And it allows you to like, swap out functions or sub-programs of your application that are already there. So you can, even if the thing is already attached at runtime, just replace a function of it and basically put in your new code. Um, it's a super powerful concept. Like You can do a lot of different things. I've seen people doing interesting uh, things with that. Um, but you have to be kind of careful because it's not, it's not as usable as other features from BPF. Um, the first or the main restriction is you cannot use it recursively. So in your whole call stack, like in your whole function stack, you can only have one function that got F replaced at some point of time. You cannot have multiple of them. So as soon as you, as you have used it once in your stack, you should not use it somewhere else in the stack. You can still replace that same function again and again, but you cannot replace something up in the stack or lower in the stack. Um, and that combined with another kind of feature. So this functionality every place is often used in infrastructure, like libxdp, for example, uses that to attach multiple XDP programs to one network interface. That's something that the kernel doesn't provide, but libxdp allows you to do that. And that's based on the, lib uh, on the every place functionality, for example. So if you are writing XDP programs, you can probably not ever use F replace because libxdp already does that thing. So F replace is something you want to use in your, in your infrastructure maybe. If you're building infrastructure for the BPF ecosystem, that's an interesting thing to use and to know about. But it might be not that useful in, in your applications. I wanted to show it anyways because it's super powerful. And if you're reaching like the limits of what you can do with the other method I showed before, maybe F replace is the thing you need to really get forward. So be sure it is there, but be careful when you're using it. Um, next up, when we combine programs at runtime, load time, whatever, so we're building more complex applications out of our programs, um, we want to make sure that those applications do what they are supposed to do. Um, so let's jump to testing. There is a way that probably a lot of you already know if you're using eBPF or if you're developing an eBPF. And that's, you're basically running your full application in some environment to test it, right? So in, in networking, it's usually a combination of network namespaces, uh, virtual ethernet pairs, shell scripts, bridges, and so on. And you basically set up uh, a network within, like a virtual network within your computer, have the different uh, namespaces, and you run your application inside that, um, yeah, inside that, those namespaces, basically. Um, that's a cool thing, like I've written here. It's used in self-tests. It used, it's used in demos. I've seen it used for examples as well. Um, so it's, it's a pretty simple thing, actually, right? You can just set up your network and just run your application within that network that you set up. Kind of difficult is how do you observe if your application is really doing the right thing, right? So. You cannot test your application directly, but what you're doing in networking, for example, you're usually just sending traffic to your, through your application and see if it does the thing you expect. And if, I don't know, the traffic is dropped in between, do you know why it dropped? You don't know. It's just not there anymore. And then you start looking, so where's the issue coming from? Is it coming from my application? Is it coming from, I don't know, some setup issues? Is it, if I run this, same script on another system? Is everything in the same place that I expect it to be? All these different issues that you get 
if you're just basically running testing on your on your main machine. So it gets kind of hard to observe what is going wrong, uh, what goes wrong, and it's also kind of brittle. Sometimes it's like mm, like you have a lot of race conditions there. If you set up network interfaces, what does the system do with them, and so on. And another thing is that if you do stuff like that, you need to change the system of your developers, right? And I can say for myself, I don't like people adding network interfaces to my systems. I have, like, they're using IP spaces. I might be using them as well. And that's always causes, of, like, causes some issues. So um, I want to show you one other technique that you can use to debug or to test eBPF programs um, that doesn't require all these things. And that's called uh, BPF uh, test run or BPF proc test run. Um, so that's a way where you load your BPF objects, just your BPF objects, not the full application, but really just the kernel parts or the BPF parts of it. You load these objects like you would in your program as well into the kernel. Then you know already those programs pass the verifier. And then you basically run that program without attaching it to the real thing. So you don't attach it to your network interface or to your syscall but you just run it with a defined context that you give it, like you pass a buffer to it with a context, and you run the program with that. So you can think of it like unit testing for your BPF program. You take the BPF program, give it a defined input, and run it and observe the output. Um, that's, of course, super useful for network programs where the context is super simple. It's usually just a network packet. Um, it can be used for most network pro uh, program types, um, it can be used for others as well. I know at least for syscalls it can be used, for trace points it can be used, and the full list uh, is in that link. Um, the slides are shared in the, in the schedule, so you can get the slides from there and click the link if you want to. Um, the, uh, I want to quickly give you some hints on how to use it, because the documentation, as some parts of the BPF documentation are, are is pretty sparse. But my, my hint is, take a look at struct BPF test run opts in libbpf for like to get started. So you can really see all the options that you have for running programs in that testing environment. And the core idea of it is you build a packet in like user space memory, you allocate some memory, you write your packet data into it, craft a network packet as you, yeah, as you would do it otherwise. Like it's just basically you, you place your packet data there um, or your context if you're a, if you're speaking about syscalls, um, then you pass all these, like the full buffer, you pass the full buffer to the kernel, to your, to that BPF test run function. And the kernel then continues to execute the BPF program in the kernel. So it's not like running in user space or anything, it's really running in the kernel on your buffer. If you ask it to, it can run the program repeatedly. So that's, that's interesting, for example, for, for benchmarking reasons, if you want to run multiple times. And after the execution, the kernel returns the result of your um, of the execution. So it returns, for example, the modified network packet, if you're speaking about that. It returns the, the usual return value of your program. Um, so you know what would have happened if that thing was uh, like being run in the kernel at like a normal hook. And for benchmarking reasons, it returns the average runtime as well. So it's a pretty nice thing that you can use for unit testing, like I said, for benchmarking as well, especially for networking where you have like programs that are usually time sensitive, so you want to process the packets quickly. So that's why you can use it for benchmarking as well. Um, so next, I want to talk about the eBPF helpers and kernel functions. Um, those are basically all the APIs that you can use from your application. Um, it's it's basically a set of functions that you can call, right? And for you as a developer, it doesn't make a difference if you're calling a BPF helper or a kernel function or kfunc. That's, that's not different, it looks the same, it's just a function call. Um, the difference for you as a developer is that BPF helpers are part of the stable user space API of the Linux kernel. So there is a man page documenting them and that's part of the stable API. So that will not change in a backwards incompatible way. So your programs using BPF helpers will always, like if they run on a current kernel, they will run on a new kernel as well. On the other hand, we have kfunks, and they are not necessarily stable. 
there are some lifecycle guarantees attached to them, like they should follow some rules, and those rules roughly boil down to we don't want to change them without a reasonable justification, and we don't want to remove them without reasonable justification, and there should be a deprecation period if we want to remove them, but it's not guaranteed. So if, if we see there is an issue with those functions, and it's reasonably bad, that issue, then we can just remove the function or the kfunc. So it, if you want to use kfunc, it's a bit more of testing you should put into place when you are when new kernel versions are released, or at least check if the functions are still there and if they still work in the same way. Um, sometimes these help of uh, like these kfuncs are also explicitly unstable. So there are functions that are explicitly unstable. One example for that is currently um, connection like contract access. You can access the contact table from your uh, BPF program, and that thing is currently explicitly labeled as unstable. So you well, be careful when using it. That's the, the main takeaway from that. Um, the list of helpers and the list of kernel functions is basically growing with every release. So it's hard to like take a snapshot in time and say like this is what you can do, because it changes like from release to release. There are new functions added, new functionality that you can call from your uh, BPF programs. Um, and I want to quickly show you how you could navigate that space. So how you could um, find your way around and how you can find out which functions you can call and which ones are available. So for BPF helpers, it's kind of easy. So there is the there is a man page that's called BPF helpers. And you can just type man BPF helpers and you could get a long list of functions that you can use. And I invite you to just step through that once and see what's available. The functions are somewhat descriptive, like the names are somewhat descriptive, so you can at least guess which area of functions are available. Um, I would not want to guarantee that everything is documented in that man page. So there is this uh, header file that I linked here, or that I, where I showed the path here. You can go to that uh, header file and take a look. So all the functions must be in there, that you, like all the BPF helpers must be in there that you can use. Um, for kernel functions or kfunks, it's not that easy. There is no man page documenting all of them. Um, so in the end, it boils down to you need to look at the kernel source if you want to know which kernel functions or kfunks you can use. Um, some of them are documented in the normal kernel documentation, but not all of them. So a lot of them are basically only viewable if you look at the kernel source. Um, but one nice thing is all of these kfunks should be marked with underscore underscore BPF kfunk. So if you just grab in the kernel source for that, you should get a list, a long list of functions that you can use, and it should be almost complete. Like there shouldn't be any other functions that you missed that way. Um, right, so as a summary, what I want to show you with that talk is that basically the, the BPF and development environment got a lot better in the last uh, years, a lot easier, a lot more comfortable, and so you can really build more complex programs more easily. Um, and one particular nice thing about everything that I show today is um, these features are not, um, yeah, th these are not from like yesterday's kernel. They are not super bleeding edge, but they are present in kernel for a while already. So if you have a reasonably de uh, recent distribution or Linux distribution, you can use these features today in your program. Like if you target something that is somewhat current, you can use it today and you don't have to wait the, for the next two years for those uh, functions to arrive and for those features to arrive. And um, yeah, with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, um, please go ahead. <laughs> sure. Thanks for the talk. Uh, uh, about F3 play. Mm -hmm. So correct me if I'm wrong. So this is happening at a runtime, right? And uh, previously, you mentioned that uh, now, at the in modern BPF, we don't get unbounded by the loops, so you can have unbounded loops. So, is it uh, correct to say that F3 plays can have now uh, that I mean, it, it is having a runtime, so you don't need an upper bound and lower bound. So you can have a uh, uh, number of loops which are not bounded by the iteration. Is it? Um. So the question is basically if we can kind of escape with 
if we place and the loops, like the unbounded yeah, loops, yeah. if we can escape kind of the limitation that it has to stop at some point yeah. of time. Um, no, not necessarily. So um, everything still passes uh, through the verifier and it's not really unbounded. So the, let's take the BPF loop function, for example. That's also like, um, it's a helper function as well. So that's code that is not within your BPF program and you don't control it, yeah. but the code that iteratively calls your callback function yeah. is part of the kernel. Okay. So you pass a number of iterations to that function yeah. and then the kernel makes sure to call the next function a number of times okay. and only that number of times and that there is an upper bound to that. So it's not unbounded in that way. And no matter if you every place anything after that, that doesn't change anything. Yeah, yeah, you go ahead. What's the reason that K function is not documented? I mean, it's, it's like Linux is a huge code base. So is it an open issue that people aren't documenting K functions because? Um, so what I can add there, it's, it's not that they're not documented at all. Okay. It's just not like the documentation is not exposed. Like you don't see, like it's not in the normal kernel documentation, for example, that's rendered online. But if you search for K functions, like the BPF K func thing in the kernel, mm -hmm then usually these functions have some kind of annotations on top of them saying like, yes. this function does this and that, those are the parameters. So it's not completely undocumented, um, but it's not openly documented in a like online rendered way. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, oh, thank yep, you. No, 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 oh, 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 one hand. Sure, go ahead. So, like, in like a sentence or something, what's like, so there's the new building block side of things even, what's an example of like, how that may not work as it like for, from a user perspective, like, what enables that wasn't possible before? So, uh, he was asking for one sentence, basically, what you can do now, what was not possible for. Yeah, or an example for that. Um, so for me, the most interesting things are, um, let's say these composability things, so you can um, build more complex applications and really you're not bound to the strict rule, I build my program first and then I load into the kernel anymore. So you can really change at runtime what is going on, in, like in the most extreme case. And what is possible through that is, for example, what I told beforehand, the libxdp, so the library that's used for interaction with XDP programs, they found a way to attach multiple XDP programs to one interface using f replace. And beforehand, there was a one-to-one -one mapping, like your network interface could have had one XDP program, and you could run it, but that's it. And they made it possible that multiple programs can attach different programs to the same interface. That's, for example, something that is enabled by these new functionalities. <laughs>